Is there really a battle for the hearts and minds of the NJGOP? Hey, everybody, it's Reporters Roundtable. I'm David Cruz. Our panel today, Colleen O'Day is the senior writer and projects editor for NJ Spotlight News. Fred Snowflack is a columnist with Insider NJ. And Mike Kelly is the columnist for The Record and NorthJersey.com. We'll hear from the panel in just a few minutes, but we begin today with an assessment of the GOP in the aftermath of the Fox defamation settlement. Here to talk about that and more is Republican State Senator and Budget Officer Declan O'Scanlan. Senator, always a pleasure, man. Good to see you. Same here, David. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So you tweeted recently, uh, I guess the day after the, the Fox settlement, time to put this issue, these claims, and all who perpetuate them behind us. Who are you talking to there? I'm talking to anybody who's going to perpetuate them. Yes, including uh, former President Trump. Uh, you know, can he pivot at this point and, and talk about relevant things? He absolutely can. And he could be pretty articulate when, when he puts his mind to it on the issues that, that people care about. This is no longer one of them. Uh, and, and we have to understand as a Republican Party, first off, what's our overarching mission? And then what's our goal in this upcoming election, uh, in the next national election in, in 24? Uh, I think uh, those things overlap and winning and controlling policy needs to be our goal, not uh, perpetuating or, or affirming claims of stolen elections, which have been pretty thoroughly debunked now. But even if someone uh, wants to continue to debate those things, they are not the things that are going to win elections for Republicans. Uh, there's a number of people who said that more eloquently than I have, Governor Christie being one of them. Uh, but it's time. And, you know, Fox News was the chief purveyor of these theories. And we now know that the chief purveyors who were doing it were trashing these theories uh, moments before they would go on air sometimes. Yeah. So it's time to put it behind us, uh, move on, and focus on the issues that swing voters who we can't win without care about. Well, you mentioned uh, Trump. Has the New Jersey party come to terms on the Trump question? Uh, no, I think, and it's probably a little early for that. Uh, but, you know, there's debate that's going on. I speak to a lot of folks, uh, and I think there's very open-minded debate. And I think that it is starting to be framed in the, in the, the way I put it before. We need to, to decide what our, our overarching goal is. Uh, if it is to win, then our path is absolutely clear. Again, we need to start talking about things that will persuade uh, middle-of-the-road, undecided voters to come our way. We saw the negative impact that focusing on some of these tangential issues can have in last year's elections. That was supposed to be this massive red wave that, that never materialized. Uh, it, was, it was a red ripple. Uh, we should have won the House by 60 seats. We should have won a majority in the Senate. Uh, we didn't do either one of those things. Uh, so that is a clear message to the Republican Party that, again, the folks that we need to win, and there's a high concentration of those swing voters here in New Jersey, but, but those voters that we care about, who we need to care about and need to have with us, uh, are ready for us to be over talking about those issues and ready for us to move on. Red Ripple, that sounds like a really delicious table wine. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. You, you called uh, your party a big tent party when, when we spoke a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and, and I made a face, and, and you made a face. Uh, that suggests a diversity of what? Thought in your party? Um, yeah, there is, there's a pretty broad group. I just spoke to folks uh, walking by my house uh, uh, 20 minutes ago uh, who said to me that they are looking for new energy in the Republican Party, uh, they are, uh, you know, they won't necessarily vote for us unless we provide that energy. Uh, and they were pretty, these are pretty moderate folks. We talked about several issues. Uh, and there's room for those people in the party. And look, we cannot be a party of purity uh, unless that is all we're going to be and be out of power. Uh, we need to be a party with conviction, uh, communicate areas. Look, I happen to be pro-life. 
there are plenty of people in the party and plenty of those swing voters who are pro-choice. There needs to be a discussion and dialogue between us with mutual respect. Uh, and there is room for that. And the party can do that. And it's shown in the past it could do that. Uh, so I really do believe we're a big tent party. Uh, and I believe that uh, this, you know, we can have that debate at the very top and we can impress people with that fact and win over those voters. I'm absolutely confident of the that. Demo the Democrats that I talk to say there's two sides to your party, the right wing and the right wing nuts. Unfair? Uh, that is absolutely unfair. Uh, again, you Would know, you I say, can, though, that there are, are some wing nuts uh, uh, having a moment in your party right now? Look, there's wing nuts on both sides of the aisle, by the way. The crazy leftist nutcase progressives, uh, they're, they're a pretty big percentage of the Democratic Party. And they're in charge, by the way, at the national level. So they really need to worry about that. There are wing nuts, though. Yeah, there's, there's look, there are colorful, interesting, and I say this uh, with affection, crazy people on both sides of the aisle. And both parties need those folks, too. We need to energize the base. Uh, if you don't, though, want to uh, get into bed with, with destructive people. I believe the, the Democratic Party has, has probably done that more from a policy perspective than the Republican Party has. But there is a limit. You, you know, there are uh, some wings of the party that you, you need to let them know that, you know, we're not going to pander to you. Uh, uh, but look, there's some really, really uh, brilliant strong-leaning conservative or, or hardcore conservatives in the party who I genuinely like, uh, who can still have a dialogue, who can yeah. still realize that some of the people in the party they're going to disagree with, and be able to encourage people to vote for them, too. We absolutely need that. And and I think we have that. We just need to uh, make sure this, this happens consistently at, at the state level for this coming fall's elections here in New Jersey, where we need to elect more legislators, Republican legislators. And then at the national level. It's going to be a fascinating couple of cycles coming up. We were talking, you, you mentioned the, the state elections coming up, the entire legislature's up. We had Chris Russell and Dan Bryan on Chatbox this week. I asked about where Republicans expected to make some inroads, and Chris Russell rattled off a half dozen districts. Dan Bryan, same question, not a one. What does that say to you? Oh, uh, no, I think that there's, there's a number of areas where I... Uh, certainly regions where we have opportunities, where some of these districts overlay, uh, certainly down south. South Jersey has been trending uh, Republican really dramatically and interestingly now for a decade, uh, but certainly in a concentrated way in the past you know, half dozen years. Uh, look at, at Mike Testa's district, for one. Uh, he's done a fabulous job as chairman, as senator, uh, really uh, turning that district around. I don't even know who's running against them on the D side, uh, I think we probably know that name, but th they're not really even contesting it anymore. There's a number of areas where uh, we can make inroads, uh, you know, in central North Jersey as well. Uh, I think we have, have a real shot here. And look, we've got a great narrative. The, the, uh, it's very easy to tell the story of fiscal responsibility in New Jersey that Republicans have espoused for years. Uh, we could tell that story. Uh, we could tell about... Uh, our, our detailed plans for effective leadership that I think will appeal, again, to those key right-leaning swing voters that if we get them, we can win. All right. Uh, switching gears here, probably have time for this last question. Uh, we heard about Senate President Nick Scatari and some campaign spending that would have probably drawn a complaint from the Election Law Enforcement Commission, except that they're past the statute of limitations. I feel like we're going to start seeing a lot of this. Is there any way to make the uh, Elections Transparency Act smell good? There is not. It, it, was, it was a, look, I could call it, I could be generous and call it a tragic missed opportunity. Uh, I could be less generous and say it turned out to be exactly what the Democrats wanted, uh, which was to defang uh, the Election Law Enforcement Commission. Uh, that is what happened. So either way, it really was an awful piece of legislation. Nobody who voted for that piece of legislation can lay claim going forward to care about fair, honest, open, and accountable elections because the entity is irrelevant now. Uh, they, it's very hard to do these investigations within two years. It sounds like a long yeah. time, but you have candidates themselves who, who stall these, these investigations. It's really a shame. Uh, and no, there was a way. You could have fixed it pretty easily. 
not you could go into five year statute of limitations from 10, cut it in half, would have been reasonable. You could have left some independence as far as the commission members and the choice of the executive director uh, not being of all of these people all appointed by the governor. Uh, it really smells. Yeah. And it's a shame. All right. Senator Declan O'Scanlan, great to see you, man. Thanks for taking a few minutes with us. David, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, panel, Colleen, Fred, Mike, greetings to you all. Colleen, I joked this week that Joe Biden was running for re-election, even though 50 percent of the Democrats don't want him to. Uh, has there been a larger enthusiasm gap for a sitting president that you can remember? Well, I mean, I think it depends on what your definition is. Uh, you know, if you look at at the Trump presidency, certainly half the country didn't like him either. Um, so, yes, the, but I mean, I think if we go back before these times, you know, presidents have ups and downs. But I, I, the issue clearly with with Biden is his age yeah. and that, you know, he would be, I believe it's 86 at the end of his term if he does win a second a second term. So uh, that's the question. And I, I mean, I guess it doesn't matter to, to, to ask now whether he should be running because he is running, but, mm. but clearly a lot of Democrats would have preferred someone else. Yeah. Uh, lots of talk about uh, mental acuity from uh, Republicans. Biden is 80 right now and has sometimes looked every one of those years, if we're being honest. Um, but is that fair game? Here's here's Rutgers professor uh, Saladin Ambar from a story that we did on this earlier in the week. Let's hear that and then come back in a minute. In my opinion, I think the, the demand of the job, you know, um, require good health. And I think uh, probably a younger person would be better, you know, um, just to be utterly frank. It doesn't mean someone Biden's age can't do the job. And the question is, is that person best for the job? Uh, probably not. I think the best argument Democrats can make is Biden is the best person in this moment for the job. Mike Kelly, you asked if raising Biden as age as a campaign issue was ageist. What'd you come up with? Well, I think it is a little bit ageist. I also think uh, these uh, continuing uh, accusations from Republicans about Biden's dementia and that sort of thing, you should read my the mail that I get from some of these Republican voters. Uh, I mean, it just screams out with bigotry and uh, uh, over this sort of thing. Look, is Biden an old guy? Absolutely. He's really old. But, you know, the Democrats are going with the best right now. I agree with your the previous commentator from Rutgers. This, you know, he's probably not the, the best guy who we would like to see running. But right now, this is what we've got. I mean, look at the Democratic bench. I'm sorry, Pete Buttigieg, no way. Come on, Kamala Harris. She she's not ready for prime time. I don't think, and I think the voters would would say say as much. And if the Democrats want to win, I think Biden is their best bet. I really I really believe that. I I also think he's doing a pretty good job. I mean, uh, I do wish he was a lot younger, but I I think given the set of cards he was handed when he walked into the White House, uh, I think he's done a pretty good job. And you know something, as I said in my column this week. There's no chaos in this White House. There's no scandals uh, that, that we're looking at every other week that we have with Trump. Uh, Biden lowered the temperature, and that's no small thing. And I think this other issue that he's running for the soul of America, that is hugely important. I mean, we essentially had a liar, a man who simply lied at will in the White House under Donald Trump. And, I, and now I think we've got somebody who's very, very different. And I think that that is important in our country. And I, and I think we need to recognize that. And, yeah, I think age, age is a really important issue to discuss. But I also think we need to discuss some deeper issues. And I agree with Senator O'Scanlan about his the, the question of, you know, physical responsibility. And I think Biden needs to circle back and really touch on some of the so-called kitchen table issues and not just simply focus on soul of America, as important as that is. Right. So I, I, I think that's the, that's the field that we've got right now. 
All right. Fred, Ronald Reagan was 70 when he became president, and many people thought uh, he was too old. 70 is not 80, but is 80 the new 70? It, it may be, but I think, remember, like, Republicans, because Republicans said Joe Biden had, quote, unquote, dementia when he ran the first time. So yeah. that's going to continue. Obviously, it is ageism, but just because something is ageism doesn't mean it's not going to survive as a political attack. So we know that's going to continue throughout throughout the campaign. I think the danger for Democrats is that, as we know, a lot of people, at least some people, only vote once every four years. And they don't really follow things that closely. And they may and they see an 82-year-old guy, they may say, hey, he's just too old to run. Now, what could help, quote unquote, is that if he runs against Donald Trump again, which is certainly a possibility, then the age, then there's the age issue kind of disappears because they're both old guys. But I mean, right. in theory, I mean, if he runs against a Ron DeSantis, despite Ron DeSantis' vulnerabilities, I mean, I think the danger for them is that some people may say, hey, here's a guy who's 82 and here's a guy who's 45. And they may right. just, some may just lean automatically to the younger guy. I think yeah. that's, that's a danger. There's nothing anyone could do about that. All right. Our state politics has been all over the place this week. Colleen, the state Supreme Court is hearing arguments on whether former Assemblyman Jason O'Donnell, <laughs> running for mayor of Bayonne in 2019, accepted a bribe when he took a bag of cash, $10,000 worth, and promised the giver a big city job. O'Donnell's argument is that he was only a candidate and not the mayor, so it wasn't a bribe. I mean... That's some chutzpah right there, no? It's This is New Jersey, after all, and that is Hudson County, so I doesn't surprise me at all. I do want to note, too, that I believe that was a Baskin-Robbins ice cream mm. bag full of cash, which just, you know, those those are like our pink and brown. It just really, <laughs> the image is great. Um, yeah, I'm totally, and, and I think the, the argument, at least as I understand it, um, while he won the argument in the in the superior court, the appellate division said, come on, this is, you know, this is silly. <laughs> Obviously, when he becomes, if he becomes mayor, um, he that he has the power to, to fulfill this bribe. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I, that may be where the Supreme Court is ruling uh, or is is leading. But um, we will certainly yeah. find out. I, I, I want to see a, a ruling that just says, come on. Mike yeah, Kelly, thank you. I, I feel some strong condemnation brewing over there. You want to say something about this? Oh, my God. This is such a Jersey story. Keep it tight, story. Mike. Keep it tight. I w <laughs> this is such a Jersey story. I agree. There should be a ruling from the Supreme Court. Come on. And uh, Mr. O'Donnell should, in my opinion, don a hair shirt and ask forgiveness. Uh, what, a, what a ridiculous move he made. Just yeah. ridiculous. Fred, I don't remember much about Jason O'Donnell in the assembly, but some may remember him as the guy that Barbara Buono wanted as party chairperson when she ran for governor. Yes, so indeed, he's yeah. a long way from there now, isn't he? Are you what? Yeah, no, I mean, I know what you, what everyone is saying. It's something about basic common sense. If someone gives you cash in a paper bag, whether it's Baskin Robbins or whatever it is, I mean, that's not exactly good. You shouldn't take it. It's, it's kind of kind of incredulous to say that it's not a bribe. Obviously, it was a bribe, and right. I hope the Supreme Court agrees. All right. Governor stuff, because why not? Jersey City Mayor Steve Fulop out of the gate first, picked up an endorsement from Atlantic City Mayor Marty Small. Mike Kelly, who's paying attention to this stuff? Anybody? Uh, you and me and Colleen and Fred, right. I think. But uh, I'm not sure Fred's paying you... much attention to it, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought this was significant. And let me tell you why. I I think a mayor running for governor is an interesting, uh, uh, you know, candidate. I, I don't know how strong Fulop will be if he'll he get any traction whatsoever. But I respect Marty Small. And I think he's I, th I and I think this could very well be a very, very interesting endorsement. I, I, who knows what's going to happen in the long run? But I, I, I thought it was noted uh, uh, when I when I heard about this and I took note of it, I should say, uh, because I think when you're having a mayor run and other other mayors start to get behind him, let, let's see what can happen here. Yeah. Colleen, uh, former Senate President Steve Sweeney 
He'll, he's still being coy about running for governor, but he's got a new 501c4 backing him. Technically, these groups and the candidates are not supposed to coordinate. But if Sweeney speaks at their fundraiser and Governor Murphy's wife runs one of these and Phillip's wife uh, runs another one and Jack Cittarelli uses the name of one of the groups as a catchphrase in interviews, not suggesting that it does with any of the aforementioned individuals, but why shouldn't people believe that coordination never takes place? Oh, I, it's just, I, I mean, it's a given. You know, I think it's its its a given. Uh, it doesn't take place overtly, but it certainly takes place in, in other ways. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things we've seen at the federal level is that the candidate or usually the incumbent will yeah. put up pictures or B-roll just in a in a public place on the internet and then this group can use that yeah. to create yeah. its ads. I mean, come on. That's maybe it's not technically coordination but we we all know what's going on. We but need of course another we would ruling expect, that says come on. Another come Absolutely. on. We would, we would expect that if if Sweeney's running there's going to be a dark money group behind him. Yeah. Fred, what is the potential of the attorney general's investigation into some George Norcross associated companies in Camden. Should we be watching that for something? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think this is this has been simmering for a long time. You remember the special panel that Phil Murphy had that really looked into this, and nothing, and nothing. I guess nothing really of concrete happened then. But yeah, this is obviously something to look at, and and everyone, well, not everyone, but the people who follow this understand. Steve Sweeney's entanglement with, with George Norcross, and that, of course, is an issue, too. And I think, I, I don't know what others think. I don't see Steve Sweeney running for governor. Even if he does run for governor, I don't wow. think he'll be a formidable candidate at all. I mean, we saw, obviously, George Norcross's leverage seems to be lessening a bit. And when Steve Sweeney lost his Senate seat to a guy who famously spent virtually no money, I mean, that's, that's not exactly a good way to run for governor. Mike Kelly, I got about 20 seconds for this. Uh, Congressman Tom Kane Jr. facing demonstrators calling on him to show his face and hold a live uh, town hall. Is this just Sue Altman making noise? I'm trying or? to reach Tom. I'm trying to reach Tom Kane Jr. now on the phone, and I'm having. <laughs> I'm getting busy signals. Uh, where is, is the, he? Uh, yeah. But let me ask you this, though. Seriously, is the public really hankering for two hours with Tom Kane Jr.? I know. Uh, can't we watch Netflix or something else? But yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, I think this is much ado about nothing. Tom Kane Jr. is trying to find himself. And in, in the current state of the Republican Party, it's really tough to be that traditional Jersey moderate GOP guy or gal. Uh, it just it just is, is, is simply difficult to do that, I think, in the Congress. And I think he's just I think he's biding his time and taking his time. That doesn't say the Democrats are not going to be biting at his heels, which is what they're doing. Netflix and chilling with Tom Kane Jr. <laughs> All right, time for our only in Jersey moments, headlines and notes that are quintessentially Jersey. Colleen, you got one for us. I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but yet again, the question <laughs> arose in Trenton on Thursday, is there a central Jersey? I mean... Is there an is there another place that wouldn't acknowledge or where there's such a debate over whether a portion of the state exists? We heard it from uh, Senator Zwicker uh, during a hearing of the Budget Committee where he was talking to the Secretary of State. Let's hear that. My last question is probably the most important question that I that I have, critically important, actually, mm -hmm. um, uh, directed to you. Does Central Jersey exist? <laughs> Without commenting on any specific legislation, I would say Central Jersey does exist. That's Critically weak. important question. Yes, Wick is the thinking man's legislator. All does right. anybody really care, though? Mine comes from Apparently Bergen County. Apparently there's legislation. Yes. Mine comes from Bergen County. Mine comes from Bergen County, and it's a lesson on talking the talk and walking the walk. Former Senate Majority I guess, Leader I guess the Loretta deeper question, Weinberg. does New Jersey really exist? So there we are. <laughs> That's... All right, mine comes from Bergen County, 
and it involves the lesson on walking the walk when you talk the talk. Former Senate Majority Leader Loretta Weinberg retired last year from the Senate. She is 88 years old. We've talked about AIDS today. She just moved into a retirement community. And while most of us would be home watching Matlock reruns before hitting the blue plate special at the TikTok, Loretta Weinberg is out there organizing grandparents against gun violence, still calling out all the politicians on the important issues. And that's Roundtable for this week. Colleen, Fred, Mike, good to see you all. Thanks. Thanks also to Declan O'Scanlan for joining us. You can follow the show on Twitter at Roundtable NJ and get fresh content every day when you subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'm David Cruz. From all the crew here at Gateway Center in downtown Newark, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz is provided by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Business Magazine, the magazine of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, reporting to executive and legislative leaders in all 21 counties of the Garden State since 1954. And by Politico's New Jersey Playbook, a topical newsletter on Garden State politics, online at politico.com.